All right. Good evening, everyone, or afternoon or morning, whenever you're watching this or wherever you're watching this across the world. We are excited to welcome you to this episode of Trisomy Talks, where we're focusing on heart issues. And we have an amazing panel of some mamas who have been through it and they have some stories to share. And I will introduce them in just a quick minute. I do want to share um, just a few announcements that are relevant. So first of all, we just want to say that our thoughts and, and prayers are going out to those who are affected by the weird weather that's going on. And hopefully everybody's good. I know some people have lost power. And if you are in a situation where you need some help, your family needs some support, please reach out because we have connections across the country. Um, and there are organizations that are ready and willing to help. So please, if you find yourself in that situation, let somebody know so we can get some help to you. Um, second, as you know, probably, you know, Trisomy Awareness Month is just around the corner. March is a big month in the Trisomy world. And I just wanted to encourage you, if you haven't checked out the resources available through Soft, there's some, you know, some fun gear that you can purchase if you want to advertise that. And it's great to spread awareness. So I just wanted to mention that. And in conjunction with that, Verity's Village is a new thing that our family is rolling out and excitedly working towards a nonprofit. I won't take up much time, but I just wanted to share that during Trisomy Awareness Month, we are going to be featuring some nonprofit organizations run by our Trisomy family. So um, the Bella Grace Foundation will have an interview with us, uh, Asher's Answer, and then the EWE Foundation are confirmed um, organizations that will share their story. So be looking for more information on that. And if you are uh, involved in a nonprofit or a, a ministry uh, local, we would love to chat with you and share your story as well. Okay. So with that said, I'm going to introduce the panelists and I'll tell you the order that they're going to go in and I'll just let them pass the mic, so to speak, from one to the other, and they will get to introduce their little ones and share their stories. And I do want to mention, I have to cut this off after about 75 minutes because I have another meeting and usually we're able to wrap up right about that time anyways, but just um, if you have any questions or comments, get them in so that we can try to address those while we're here live. Okay. So our panelists are Chelsea Crawford, and then Olivia Kraft, Mary Willard, Jessica Stone, and Erin Heddick. And so I will turn it over to Chelsea. I'm going to spotlight her. And um, then ladies, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Chelsea Crawford. I am mom to Jazz Ellington Scott. He is almost 20 months old with full trisomy 18. Um, he is definitely a heart warrior. Um, during the fetal echo that we had after we got the initial diagnosis of trisomy 18, we were told that there were a few holes in his heart and that we had leaky valves. And so we were unaware of some of the issues that we found after birth. Um, after he was born, we found out that he also had something a little more serious than his um, large VSD, which is, as everyone knows, is a typical um, issue with our trisomy babies, the VSDs and the ASDs, VSD being ventricular and then the uh, other being uh, the atrial septal defect. Um, but we found out that he had something far worse as far as prognosis, which was the Mobitz type two heart block. And he would be requiring um, a pacemaker in order to live. Um, we were told that he needed the pacemaker more than he needed the um, VSD repair. So we waited and we waited and we waited and we kept getting pushed back, kept getting pushed back. We were told that we would either be able to get one and not the other. We'd be able to get the VSD and not the pacemaker. Um, but we couldn't get both. I mean, of course, all of the trisomy parents know that we go through a lot of the typical pushback with trying to get heart repair. Um, but for him, it was a little more dire to get the um, heart black repaired. He started off um, with a very low heart rate in the 60s in one chamber, I think he had like 140s in a separate chamber. 
Um, then in the third chamber, we were like in the 90s. So we had like four different heart rates for jazz, um, which was something that I had never encountered or heard of before. And so um, he was presented to um, Texas Children's Hospital after us having sent our records to Dr. Hamill in um, Omaha, which just as soon as 2019 was what we were all having to do in the trisomy community. A lot of us were being turned down for heart repairs at our hospitals, and we were basically having to get our children over to um, Dr. Hamill. And so got the records over to Dr. Hamill, and Dr. Hamill, uh, his team was willing to operate on jazz. And right at that moment where we were just like, look, we're leaving. My son is resting heart rate. His resting heart rate was in the upper 30s, lower 40s. And right at that moment, that's when TCH came in and said, okay, we'll give him heart repair and we will fix um, the heart block with a pacemaker. I cannot confirm this, but I was told Jazz is either the first or one of the very first children with trisomy 18 to receive the, the type of pacemaker that he has at Texas Children's. Um, I know that since Jazz, we have gotten this pacemaker placed in other children successfully, thankfully. Um, the heart repair was absolutely the game changer. I said this before and I'll say it again, when it comes to trisomy 18, 13, um, nine and all of the other uh, trisomies, heart repair is the foundation. Heart repair is absolutely the foundation in all that we are able to do and advocate for our children. Um, most everything else will be turned down if your child's heart is not repaired. So um, while it is not the only issue that our children encounter and face, it is probably the most important to get addressed and get it addressed early before pulmonary hypertension uh, worries come into play and before um, other issues exasperate the already uh, issue that you have with the heart. So everything else that Jazz got after that that was important for him, you know, addressing liver issues, addressing hepatoblastoma was all um, a breeze for us really because of the heart uh, repair. Uh, we've not had any heart issues. We were cleared through cardiology a couple of weeks ago. Jazz has a completely functioning heart. We don't have the leaky valves anymore. We don't have any more of the VSDs. We don't have any holes. I think he may have maybe one or two little pin size ones but his heart, in comparison to a child that's two years old, was like for almost identical with, with the exception of the, um, the pacer leads. So the heart repair and the intervention actually kind of did something that I was not aware that could happen. And that was actually improve the heart function to the point where it was considered normal. So that's where we are with him now. Normal heart function. Um, we have had zero issues since repair, um, and we are forever grateful to Dr. Hamill and, and for, for having Dr. Hamill as a what we call a fail safe or someone to base our information on in order to present to Texas children for repair. And we're grateful for getting that repair. Like I said, and like I would tell any other parent going forward, make sure you get the heart repair as early as possible. Um, every other battle that you're going to face in the first year, that's foundational to, to have that done. So that's our story. Jazz today is healthy, relatively healthy um, as far as his uh, condition. He's happy. He loves life. He loves the Golden Girls, as everyone knows. Um, and we're grateful. And I can't say it enough. Heart repair, heart repair, heart repair. Thank you guys for listening. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Can you? There we go. Hi, guys. Um, I am Olivia, as some of you might know. My daughter is Lillian, and she is four and a half years old with mosaic trisomy 18. Um, so Lillian kind of has a bit of a funky heart. Um, not all of her cardiac anomalies are like bad. They're just kind of interesting. Um, so we actually found Lillian's heart problems before we found out she had trisomy 18. Um, so we went in for a routine, sorry, I have 
humans and dogs all over the place right now. Um, we actually found out Lillian had heart problems before she, uh, we found out she had trisomy 18 and she was diagnosed with, they thought she had, um, DORV. And then after we discovered her heart problems, we went ahead and did genetic testing and found out she did end up having, um, trisomy 18. So after she was born, we confirmed that she had a VSD that was quote by her surgeon, the size of Texas. Um, she has a, um, bicuspid aortic valve where she may end up needing it replaced in the future. Um, it's just kind of one of those things that we're going to have to monitor. Um, and then she had a PFO and may actually still have a PFO. We just found out. Um, and then she has an extra superior vena cava. So she has a right superior vena cava and a left superior vena cava. Um, and then her heart is on the left, right side of her body instead of the left. So she's kind of all mixed up, but her heart works great now. She um, spent 10 days in the NICU after she was born and did fabulous. She was on oxygen for like 12 hours and mostly just soared through her NICU stay. And then right around a month and a half old, um, she went into heart failure. So we got admitted to the PICU. And I, I remember a mom, a fellow trisomy mom, she had like posted, I think two or three days before we got admitted that her son's BNP was like 900. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so high. So, I, cause like I went and looked it up and I was like, that's just crazy. Um, well, when we got admitted, they drew a BNP on Lillian and it was like 56,000. And so they were like, yeah, she's in like severe heart failure. Um, so she had all kinds of stuff going on. She had severe tracheo, bronchial, Hi. Malaysia. Hi. Um, and she had the heart problems. And then we found out she had a cyst on her liver. And so <laughs> it was kind of like, what do we address first? And it was just absolutely crazy because everyone, I am so sorry. Um, everyone was going back and forth on, well, we need to do a trach first. Well, we need to do a heart surgery first. Well, we need to do this. Um, so she ended up crashing on, she got admitted on a Monday, she crashed on a Friday. And so we intubated her and it was a super difficult intubation. It took about two and a half hours just to get her intubated. Everyone in the pick you tried, they ended up having to call anesthesia and she got intubated with a fiber optic bronch. So our priority was trach. And then dealing with the hassle of trying to get a heart surgery at a hospital that had never done a heart surgery on a child with trisomy 18. Um, so yeah, that was a mess. It was just a bunch of back and forth. They kept setting, she has to be, you know, this at this setting on her ventilator, her BNP has to be at this level before we can do it. She has to be on at this weight before we can do it. So we were just like checking every single thing off of the list. And finally it came down to just, I told him, I was like, you guys are taking too long and my child is going to get pulmonary hypertension. And if that happens, it's on you. And so she magically got put on the schedule to get her heart repair done. Um, and they actually ended up just doing pulmonary artery bands on her because she was so little and her VSD was so big, they really wanted her to have some time to grow. And then also with all the weird cyst stuff going on, um, it was just, she was super, super complex at that time. So she had the PA bands and they were amazing for her. They ended up getting her through her first liver procedure, which was putting a drain into her liver. They got her through another liver procedure and G2 placement. And her second liver surgery was a 10 and a half hour surgery. Um, and so they were super duper nervous how her heart would handle it. Um, but it did great. She ended up finally needing her open heart surgery and complete repair on August 29th after her first birthday, which was August 3rd. Um, so she went in on the 28th and had a cardiac cath just to make sure that she didn't have any, uh, pulmonary hypertension or anything that would need to keep us from actually doing the repair. Um, and her surgeon was Dr. Huddleston and Cardinal Glenn. And I forgot to add that. Um, 
so then that Tuesday or the next day we ended up um, <laughs> having her heart repair done and she did fabulous in the OR. They were only able to patch a portion of the VSD because it was so big. <laughs> they were only able to patch a portion of it because it was so large and they were worried Mommy. if they patched the entire, Mommy. hold on one second. Um, yeah, because I'm talking and it's not nice to interrupt. Um, they were worried if they patched the entire VSD that it would mess with her heart's conductive system and she would end up needing a pacemaker. Um, so they patched part of it in hopes that it would close the rest of the way. Um, and then she came out of the OR fine um, about two-ish hours later. I noticed she had a lot of um, blood on her dressing. And so her surgeon came in like the perfect time. And Dr. Huddleston is absolutely fantastic. If you've ever met him, you know that he's like the most just like mellow guy in the world. Um, and so he comes in and I'm like, hey, can you look at this dressing really quick? I'm kind of worried she's like losing too much blood. And he moved one of her drain tubes and it just started pouring out. And he's like, yeah, I think we should probably change the dressing. And so he leaves and then like the whole OR team comes in and they're like, um, we're going to have to do exploratory I, surgery and the PICU. So I um, when I left the PICU so that they could start getting everything sterile, her blood pressure was 30 over 20. Um, and she was losing blood super duper fast. So they ended up finding out she had a pericardial effusion. Okay. which I didn't know was a thing until she had one. But basically, whenever they're repairing the VSD, Guys. they go in through the top of the hey. heart. And one of the no. sutures that they had placed <laughs> to repair the hole that they went in through popped. And so she was bleeding into her chest cavity and they had to go in and reopen her chest and repair the hole that they went in through. And then... Hole? She was Glass fine, but I think they ended up draining like 150 <laughs> mils of blood or something crazy. Out. And that like popped her um, blood pressure up. Okay. They like weren't sure that she was going to make it through the night without having to go on ECMO. Yeah. And she was ready to discharge okay. three days later. So I remember like after her surgery, one of the nurses was like, we've never seen a typical child come back from something like this, this fast. Um, let alone someone with trisomy 18 I, so wait. she's just I she's amazing she's actually Why? sleeping right now so she couldn't come visit with us but um her heart is doing really well at this point she is cleared for yearly cardiology checkups um but other than that she does pretty good you just have to monitor the bicuspid aorta and um her last echo they said that she had a pfo so She's having a bubble uh -huh. echo um, in March just to make sure that that's not causing any issues uh -huh. with her function. But as far as we know, her repair basically took care of all of her issues that were causing um, problems with her heart. So we're super thankful for Dr. Huddleston and everyone that made it possible for her to have her surgery. So I am going to um, let the next person take over because I got my hands full. If I can figure out how to mute myself. There we go. Hello. Um, so neat to hear about Dr. Huddleston. I because we uh, I'll share real quick, but Dr. Huddleston was we got two yeses for Rose's surgery when it was most critical. And it was Dr. Hamill in Omaha, Nebraska, and it was Dr. Huddleston. And um yeah, I talked to him on the phone and just Olivia saying his name. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, that was Lil's. I, I didn't even know that was Lillian's surgeon. I knew it was another trisomy family surgeon. Okay, so Rose has trisomy 18. She has full T18 and she is three years old. Rose's story, I'm gonna share here for the sake of time. I'll share um, the controversy we got stuck in. And then I'll share some of the pieces that helped us get out of that. So I felt very prepared, um, always nervous because I was aware that prejudice and denial of care and slow coding or basically slow response when a trisomy 18 child is showing uh, difficulty. 
Uh, so I went in very prepared. Um, it doesn't mean it was perfect, but I tried. And then from there I could build on it and it really helped. So I want to encourage if some people listening to this mm -hmm. talk today are pregnant or have not had heart repair yet, I really want to encourage you to get very comfortable with the thought of creating your own care plan. That's basically advanced directive. You know, if you think about it, what, what do you want to happen when you're in a critical state? Well, with our children, anytime they go into IC care, especially a neonate, especially a baby you just had, you really want to have a game plan. And something so amazing about the Trisomy 18 community is there's so many people here to help you. So I started very lost, but I went to soft and I found care plan examples. So on soft, you'll find in the tabs, people have shared their care plans. So I had created one. Um, now I'm, I know my stuff a little better, so I'm not gonna say it was perfect, but I got to follow templates that were pretty darn close to perfect. And in that, it, basic things were that Rose was full code. We were seeking full heart repair. I just go big. So we didn't really know, but I knew for sure I wasn't a wait and see, or I didn't want her at risk for being stuck somewhere that couldn't help her. So I always went pretty big. I would say she's getting her heart repaired. And then I would let them kind of come back with their banter, like, well, sure, if she shows she can, or, and then we would address each kind of hurdle that came in our way. So for sake of time, I won't go through all the no's I got throughout my whole pregnancy. Um, kids like Lillian, um, Lavender, uh, so baby Sophia, she's not baby anymore, but Sophia, all these kids I was watching and, um, I just wanted to follow the path that their parents did. And I tried my best to get fair care. So secured and fair care, which I thought we secured a surgeon. He was a surgeon we found on the soft registry that had done a heart repair on a trisomy 18 child. Um, he actually only assisted on um, a boy named Joseph, but uh, his mom helped me. And I found that surgeon and that surgeon told me that he would take Rose on. We moved to be close to where, we didn't move, but our hospital choice moved. It's an hour away from our house. Our hospital choice moved um, about an hour and a half away from my house so that I could deliver at a hospital next to our surgeon. Okay, what I, what I need to share with people is a care plan can save your child's life. Uh, we had already beat it, beat it, beat it, beat it. <laughs> we had met with the neonatologist. We had switched OBs about four times. We had spoke with the CVICU at Radies. We had secured our surgeon. We had met with his cardiology team. We had just constantly held this care plan, which they did not fully agree to, but we agreed to something and it was better than what, else, what I had. I had nothing else. So we, so I went there. Um, let's see. So when Rose was born, the care plan saved her life because she was electively intubated. She did not code, but she was electively intubated and they got her over to the heart unit. Um, from there, we believed everything was good. And we watched a fellow trisomy family, uh, Jeannie and Corey and Sophia. I would follow them as we would go through our struggles every day. And I ended up seeing Sophia fly in the snow in a storm to Omaha, Nebraska to have heart repair because her hospital had denied her. As I watched that, part of my brain was like, well, that's what we'll do. But the other part of me thought, oh my goodness, how sad for them. Here we have this great team. We have a surgeon secured. Um, I wasn't cocky, but I was a little too um, confident in my team. I really put too much confidence in my team and my daughter almost died because of it. So the day came um, where everything was a battle. Everything was a battle. Rose was raced off CPAP before she was ready. Rose was denied things like treatment of her jaundice. Um, we were starting to have teams come in and discuss letting her go. Ways that I could have my children come in and say goodbye to her. If I would just transfer to a different floor, then we could have a room. Just everything that was not my care plan. So between um, touching base with the T18 community daily, is this correct? Is that correct? Does this sound right? Does that sound right? Um, I, I, I became what I need, as expert as I needed to be because it changed our world. So never underestimate um, what we have here in each other 
because I can guarantee you it's the moms and the dads and Marty and soft that saved my daughter's life. Um, all the stepping stones, there's so many pieces. So Rose would begin to desat and do worse and worse. And basically her PDA was closing. Um, the very end of five time, I'll run through her diagnosis, but I think it's more important that I pound in the idea of a care plan. Um, I had also began when Rose was two weeks old, I kept saying who our consults were. I was faking it till I made it, you know, I was talking big, but I didn't really know how to call a surgeon and I didn't really know if they would operate on my daughter, but I started name dropping Dr. Huddleston, um, and, and, and every, um, Hamill in Nebraska. Um, I was just saying we would go to Stanford. Um, another thing is there's an article from Stanford that's now older. I think it might be 2017, but it talks about the benefits of repairing the heart for trisomy 18 and 13. If you're a parent with a child with a heart condition, it's not repaired. Print out that article. If you're ever in IC care, just tape it up in your room. That's another thing I started doing. Um, I would just tape up that article and I would, I would put in a binder, the soft caregivers manual that turned a lot of heads and changed a lot of things. Cause even, um, unit directors were looking through that and like, wow, wow, this is a, this, there's old kids in here. And it just opened up some talk. Okay. So I'll just wrap up with Rose was, uh, six weeks old when, um, we were told they would do nothing. We had been kind of calling them out and feeling like we were making them treat her correctly. But when her PDA began to close, she would desat to as low as 30 and be bagged. She needed to be intubated and then she needed her surgeon to tend to her as we planned. And we were told no. And that's a whole long story, all the stuff we were told. But another thing I wanna um, run home to parents that might have a child with a heart condition, get tons and tons of opinions because we were, they, they, you know, I was told it was impossible to repair my daughter's heart. So it was a complicated process to get out, but it only took me about, well, all of us, it took us about three days and we got accepted to Omaha, Nebraska by Dr. Hamill and Dr. Huddleston also said he would take her and help. Their NICU was taking a little longer in accepting her. So we shot off to Omaha, Nebraska. They sent Rose without me. I wasn't allowed to fly with her and they thrashed her airway when they intubated her for flight. So that was hard. But the ending of my story is we arrived at Omaha, Nebraska on Thursday and um, doctor, we were met with just phenomenal. We were met with open arms. Trisomy 18 family picked me up at the airport and um, we were told we operate Monday. So when she was initially accepted, Rady, uh, ooh, not, <laughs> the hospital we were at kept telling me, um, they won't, they won't, they, you know, they might make your child full coat, but you can't, you can't repair her heart. Um, Rose's diagnosis was dwarf and tough could be her, her, um, main diagnosis, but it's kind of semantics because she had a lot going on. She was BSD, ASD, tetralia fullo, um, her, um, pulmonary, valve disintegrated in surgery. So he did a ligation. So her heart's pretty complicated, um, but technically she's a dwarf tough um, girl. So anyways, her heart pair recovery was phenomenal. That's the quickest part of my story. Uh, she was ready to fly home commercial six weeks later. She was out of the PICU, I think in three weeks and over to the NICU, but that was for several reasons. <laughs> she was out of the PICU in three weeks, but still getting pretty intensive cares in the NICU. Um, for some reasons, just needing room in the PICU. And we were very controversial. Uh, we flew in from California. We were the first ever to come that far. Um, but that also made it very clear that they were a rescue center um, because we had no one else um, to get to us that quick and to help her. The last thing I just want to say is, Consults are so important. If you ever want to check out, you know, just go on, search Rose's name or Omaha, and then you'll see articles on us. And there's plenty of ways to reach out. And I'd be happy to share more because it's pretty complex, all that we went through, but it's not so complex that everybody shouldn't try. So um, thank you so much. And I'll just pass it along.
Hi guys, I am Jessica Stone. My daughter is Esther Marie. She is 18 months old and is full trisomy 13. She was going to join us, but decided to take a nap. So I have laid her down, but, um, her journey, actually, we did not know that she was trisomy 13, possibly until 35 weeks, um, pregnant. And so we didn't have time really to do consults everywhere. I knew that of all places, our teaching hospital here locally would be likely where I would deliver. And uh, they touted that they were trisomy friendly. Um, I transferred care over there because our um, MFM had already said that they were a status of comfort care only for trisomy 13 or 18. So I wanted to make sure I detached myself from them ASAP. So I um, ended up with high blood pressures, um, preeclampsia kicking in and went to our regional hospital um, really just to appease my mother and say, yes, I got my blood pressure checked. I was fine. And they're like, we're going to induce you right now. And um, she's fine. She's stable. Um, the MFM that had told me they were comfort care only had put her in as 37 weeks instead of 35 weeks. And um, wanted to just induce me right there at that little local regional hospital and wanted them to treat her like a normal baby. I got them to transfer me um, or I was going to leave AMA to our local hospital that was OU Children's. Um, I came in there and I was immediately greeted by a team of people that were eager to help us do our ultrasound. We did not have an amniocentesis. We just had an IPT testing. Um, and so they're like, well, it isn't confirmed, but based upon your ultrasound and um, some of the things that we're seeing, we believe that she likely um, is full trisomy 13, but we certainly can do an amnio on you right now and get that confirmation. And that just threw up red flags for me. Um, and so I made it very clear I was going to treat the child and not the prognosis. Um, as I met with the perinatal team, I made sure that they understood that that was my intent. Um, I did find each step of the way that we had to be really bold in our conversations and saying, you know, yes, I understand the prognosis. Yes, we've read the outdated uh, 2005 you know, documentation that was done based upon children born in the 60s to uh, 90s. And um, really pushed the bar there with, you know, how are Down syndrome children treated during that time? I was very blessed that I had actually um, ran across a YouTube video in my short three days at home um, from Dr. McCaffrey. And I quoted that and I made sure everybody had seen that and that they had watched that perinatal conference. Um, they brought the director of the NICU in to meet me to come up with our birth plan. And again, we said we wanted to intubate upon delivery if needed, stabilize her. We wanted to treat the child and understand everything that was going on with her so that we could make a determination on our plans. And that was great. Upon delivery, she had an Avgar of one. Um, I never heard her cry before she left the OR. Um, they did intubate her and got her up and got her stabilized. She had blood sugars in the single digits. When they called me in my room a couple of hours later, they were asking if they could go ahead and set a pick line. I had no idea. They hadn't been able to get an IV in her. Had I declined that, then they would have just let her pass. Um, just things along the way that I now know, like I wish as Mary said, I had had a more clear plan of we are full intervention, full code to the point of stabilization. Um, I wish that I had connected with Be Not Afraid um, beforehand to really work that out. Somebody had sent it to, sent the organization to us when we were already a week into the journey. Um, we did, they took her and did a full workup. They did an echo. They um, did her head ultrasounds and uh, full body x-rays. And really, as they came back, they were like, you know, her heart is, um, she has ASDs, VSDs, and a PDA. And that's really all that we're finding. She has double outlets on her kidneys, um, but her kidneys look like they're functioning fine. She looks like she has one small horseshoe kidney. Then everything else came back fine. And so, um, I was on the portion of the NICU that was for heart warriors and it was all heart babies, yet 
when the cardiology team around it, they never would come talk to me. Um, one time I finally caught a cardiologist that walked through our room and I said, Hey, like how you had a chance to read her echo. Like nobody's talked to me about it yet. And he said, have you gotten the genetic testing back yet? Um, you know, I will be really surprised if this child is full trisomy 13, um, based upon her heart, the form, the malformations are not as significant as we generally would expect from a trisomy 13 baby. And I said, we haven't gotten it back. And he's like, you know, at this point, I think what we would recommend is a PA band, um, the placement of her VSD. She had a very large one that was in the tip of her heart that would be hard to reach to close, um, without damaging the heart muscle. Um, and he said, you know, we will, we'll evaluate it more basically after you get your genetic testing results back. We spent six weeks in the NICU and never saw anyone again. They did come and do weekly echoes on her and kept saying that she was stable and nothing had changed. During that first visit, he did mention that she had the PDA, but that those usually close on their own. They would follow it. If they needed to intervene, they would. Um, so as we're, we're going along, everyone's telling me that things are progressing fine, um, that she's stable. She's doing good. She extubated after a week. She went on to NIV. Um, she did have a pretty profound cleft palate and lip, um, which made getting her secured to different types of um, oxygen challenging and to get her enough flow was a bit of a challenge. So the NIV, she wasn't really getting positive pressure off of that at all, but they slowly weaned her off of those things. She was to Kipnik most of the time. Um, they thought it was more of just her palate and really dismissed that. And then when it came time to discharge us, um, they had her down on room air. She was satting fine. I was concerned that we were over circulating her. I didn't have the education at that time to really advocate for her properly. I just noticed that she seemed to do better when she was satting in the lower nineties than when she was satting in the hundred, like at 99 to a hundred. Um, and so I would question things like that and I would challenge it. And they're like, she doesn't have revised that goals from cardiology. She's okay. Um, and the last week that we were there, the person that did her ultrasound or her echo, um, said, oh yeah, there's definitely been a change. So I made sure I asked for cardiology to come speak with me. And the director of cardiology came and spoke to me and he basically wasn't going to let it go until he, he made me cry. Um, he was going to push it as hard as he could and basically let me know that it was basically cruel to perform, um, even a palliative band on her, um, based upon the fact that she was full trisomy 13, that still required a sternotomy, um, that just isn't fair. Like she could die as soon as we took her home from something else. Um, and he really wasn't helpful knowing what I know now, I wish that I would have, um, advocated to speak to the surgeon and to hear from him that he was not on the page of intervening, um, because I later found out he had no idea who we were or how we had been treated, uh, during our NICU stay. And he is very pro trisomy and helping our children. Um, but they sent us home, uh, later I found out when I was, when we were readmitted two weeks later, that we were in severe pulmonary hypertension status. And um, as I had inquired about what had changed, they're like, oh, nothing, just the pressure in the lungs haven't dropped as we anticipate it. That's gonna help the holes close up. Um, so you guys are good to go. So they basically kept her flooding out on oxygen when they sent us home, told me to leave her just at hundred um, percent, took her home, she flooded out. Uh, within two weeks was in crisis mode, we were, having her desat down into the fifties and couldn't get her back up. So we rushed her to the emergency room at the local hospital. Um, they immediately transported us back to children's and um, she was intubated when we arrived at children's. Once we got there, no one would say the words heart failure. No one would say pulmonary hypertension. Um, they thought it was pneumonia. They were very dismissive. Um, they had cardiologists after cardiologists come and talk to us and try to tell us it wasn't our heart. Um, but I had already, because I had a friend that worked at the regional hospital, they had told me that what had came in was that she was in heart failure. So I really was challenging that and um, just started asking questions differently. 
So um, though her journey wasn't a straight one, she stayed in crisis for about a month. Um, during that time, I started working on trying to continuing to gather information to get it over to Omaha, though they were telling me she'd likely never extubate, preparing us to tell her goodbye. Um, finally, she stabilized enough that they felt like we could get her a trach to get her home. And at that point, I just went to get her the heck out of there. So we were scheduling a trach. And um, the day before her trach surgery, uh, one of the palliative doctors that actually also worked in the CVICU and had experience at Boston Children's walked in as I was reviewing my packet that I was putting together to send to Omaha. And she's like, what are, what are you doing? You know, are you getting lost in the paperwork? Um, are you avoiding spending time with her the day before surgery because you're nervous? And I was like, no, I'm getting everything ready to get a second opinion. Um, because my goal is to get her out of this hospital as fast as I can and get her somewhere that she can get life-saving surgery. And she was like, why wouldn't you have Dr. Burkhardt operate here? And I said, nobody has offered us a corrective surgery. Um, palliative was all that was offered, but it was done from a very discouraging standpoint. And, um, I said, so I want to go to a trisomy friendly hospital to help make this happen for her. And Omaha happens to have an entire division dedicated to helping the trisomy 13 and 18 children. And she said, can you give me 24 hours, um, to have a conversation with the surgeon? And I said, absolutely. Like, I would love nothing more than to have this done at home. I just don't think there's the appetite to do it. And I don't have time to waste. And so she actually went behind the scenes. She ruffled a lot of feathers. She stepped out of the role that she should have been in um, and really put her neck out there for us. But they came back and said, we'll take her to cath lab uh, to gather the information. If you're willing to delay the trach because he doesn't want her to have a trach at the point of her heart surgery. Um, and they took her to cath and ended up determining that her pulmonary hypertension was still highly responsive to just oxygen and um, I and O. Then they also determined that she was getting double the blood flow to her lungs that she was to her the rest of her body and scheduled her for her heart surgery two weeks later. They did a full um, repair the most that they could. They still could not get to the holes in the tip of her heart. Her ASD was actually um, a lot larger than what they anticipated it to be. Uh, it had just strings hanging in between um, two big holes. Uh, he said it was over the size of a quarter that he hadn't repaired an ASD that size before in his life. And um, when they stitched her up and did it, she did end up going into total heart block in the OR. Uh, they stitched through her node. And so she does have right bundle branch block um, most of the time. And um, they brought her out with pacer wires. And luckily, she did not require the pacemaker um, that they thought that she would based upon um, having to stitch through that node. So she um, stayed intubated for a week after she came out of the OR, she had been intubated at that point for a total of 70 days. Omaha prepared me and told me that no, um, none of their trisomy babies with cleft palate and lip had um, successfully extubated. Uh, they would give them up to three tries, but the 100% had had trachs. So we were mentally prepared for that. Um, we tried to extubate. She had a failed extubation. They re-intubated her. They gave her about another month to try everything out. Um, they took her, but it didn't look like she was tolerating weans on the vent settings. Um, they went ahead and did another CT. They did another bronchoscopy. Um, and they're like, we cannot see a reason why this child cannot extubate. That really bothers us. Um, and so we came up with a plan. It was the same doctor that had walked in. Um, <laughs> and basically got us our heart surgery. She's like, I just hate to give a child a trait that there's no explanation on why she needs it. And so she was like, if you're, if you're game with it, let's try to extubate her the week of her trait. And, um, if she flies on high flow, like let it keep going and hopefully you'll be fine. It's like, I am game for that. I just don't want to limp along on an IV for any amount of time. So um, they got her off of that. She is now breathing room air. She was on oxygen, a uh, small amount of it until April. So for about two additional months after we left the CVICU, um, I agree with Mary, every single intervention that we um, have needed since her heart surgery 
has just an open door for us because um, the respect for the cardiology department, once they have cleared a child for interventions, um, they get their interventions. So I couldn't um, agree more. I think Jazz's mom had said that's kind of your gateway as well. And I, I agree, it's gotten us everywhere we need it to go and we are forever grateful. So I will open it up for any questions that anyone has. Aaron. Hi all. Um, I feel like I'm hearing some common threads along the way and it just um, stirs my heart. But um, my name is Erin Hedick and I am mom to Cora. She will be three next month. She has full trisomy 13 and she is considered to be in compensated heart failure. Um, due to a condition called left ventricle non-compaction or LVNC. Um, our journey with heart issues started prenatally when Cora's ultrasounds and echocardiograms showed increasing problems with her PDA, PFO, ASD, VSD, and trabeculations, which are bundles or pieces of muscle that extend into the left ventricle. Um, we decided to intervene surgically at birth if needed. However, after being in the NICU for one week and running all the tests, it seemed as if everything was self-resolved except for her trabeculations, which we were, were, we were told would resolve on their own. Um, so she was discharged from cardio after about a week, and then we were transferred to the feed and grow unit uh, for one more week, and then she came home. So I'm going to fast forward about a year and a half, which was full of lots of other issues and surgical interventions, um, but then we found ourselves seeing cardiology again. And we all know we are our child's greatest advocate, but I wanted to reiterate how important each of you are as a primary caregiver and how your insight into your child's specifics can make all the difference. Um, for example, we have Cora on a pulse ox every night, as it indicates so much since she is often asymptomatic. And we had noticed that for several nights in a row, her resting heart rate was low. It wasn't dangerously low, but it was just odd for her. So I had mentioned it to her immunologist at an appointment. And because it's Cora, she referred us to cardio. Um, after her echo, EKG, and Holter monitor um, um, results came back, it revealed that she had LVNC. And um, the initial difficulty of hearing this news was, of course, my understanding that many of our kiddos um, pass away due to heart failure and uh, breathing issues. But secondary to that was the fact that it was likely an ongoing problem since birth that had been dismissed or overlooked. Um, unlike most people, Cora's trabeculations never compacted, hence the non-compaction. So she should not have been discharged from cardio without at least a follow-up appointment getting full clearance. Um, and now, in part, that is why it's causing her heart failure, along with a dilated left ventricle and atrium, fluid around her heart and lungs. Her body, in part now, has learned how to function with her heart like this, which is why she's considered in compensated heart failure. And she requires follow-ups every three months because this condition often fluctuates between severe and moderate failure for her. Um, each time we go, uh, her doctor um, has them perform an EKG and an echocardiogram. So another thing I wanted to mention is getting sufficient explanations for um, symptoms that you see. Um, I had always noticed that Cora would get really sweaty in her first year of life and um, edema during procedures or while on IV fluids. Um, it was often understood as like a T13 thing when they would ask, and I would communicate to them that she'd been discharged from cardio, so that probably wasn't the reason. But later, upon further inspection, we instead learned that this was an indication of her heart issues all along. So now she always goes through cardio anesthesiology during procedures, and her fluid intake is really closely monitored. 
Um, other symptoms we were told to look for are failure to feed and grow, which can just be kind of a difficult symptom for any of our kiddos, but it's something we look for um, or when she gets fatigued during eating or during therapy. Um, I also wanted to highlight the importance of finding a doctor who values, marvels, and wants to learn from our children's uniqueness. Uh, my husband and I jokingly call it the trifecta doctor, um, one who has great skill and a willingness to learn, kind bedside manner and is eager to listen, and someone who actually cares about your child. They do exist and they are worth finding. Um, we actually switched doctors pretty immediately when we were inpatient for a different issue and discovered that Cora wasn't being treated as aggressively to help her heart and prolong her life as much as possible. And it was a simple thing that they could have done, just adding some medicines to slow the damage. So her LVNC um, cannot be resolved through surgery and there is no cure. So her current treatment includes medicines geared towards preventing further damage to her heart. Um, she is on an ACE inhibitor, uh, two diuretics for differing functions and a baby aspirin to prevent strokes. And depending on her heart um, test results, she's also been on beta blockers in the past. Um, she currently has no arrhythmia, so there's no need for a pacemaker. And if her function decreases and stays low, we have discussed placement of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator or ICD, since sudden cardiac arrest would be the greatest concern. Um, right now, she's so small that it would re require open heart surgery. So if possible, we would wait until she's bigger and they can go through the neck for placement. Thankfully, we're not close to needing to make that decision, but these are the hard conversations that we have with her cardiologist, who I'm really grateful has stated that he will never use her T13 diagnosis as an excuse not to treat her, but will also consider it so that he can care for her holistically and not overlook anything else happening in her body. Um, I'm sure, like us, many of you have been told that our children will never be a candidate for a heart transplant, um, but I always hold out hope that our children will not need it, that advances in acceptance and technology will be uh, made, and that they'll just continue to surprise us like they always do. And I wanted to thank you all for letting me learn from each of you and letting me care, uh, share a core story. Right. Thank you. I'm going to change the view here. Okay. Thank you so much, ladies. I learned a ton. <laughs> we have not had to go the heart surgery route. Um, uh, Verity did have three VSDs at birth, but um, one of which they thought they would need to operate on before she turned one. Our story is very different. Hers just started patching over on its own. And so they just have been monitoring her. So she's unrepaired, but balanced and, and doing well. So I learned a lot and there's some uh, acronyms that you all used <laughs> that I don't think I could tell you exactly what those words are, <laughs> but I know I've, I've seen them alluded to. So um, we don't have, I don't think there are any questions that have come. We're a small group tonight, but I know that a lot of people actually registered for this trisomy talk. So I'm sure people are going to come in after the fact. So I want to give you all an opportunity if you want to just unmute. If you thought of anything while another mom was sharing a story that you thought, oh yeah, I really wanted to share this, please jump in and, and let's hear from you one more time before we wrap it up. I have one thing to add. You go ahead. If we, I think I, the one thing that I think is really, 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 really important um, that I think that Jessica mentioned was, and also Aaron mentioned was how we all interact with each other and how, you know, I think sometimes when people are new to the group and especially for the pregnant moms and the moms who are expecting or even the ones who just aren't quite sure of what they want to do just yet with the diagnosis, I think that sometimes our information can be overwhelming. And as you get through this journey or you go further into the journey, further into your pregnancy and then into the stage where your baby is here and they're alive and they're on this earth, you it's a lot of confusing things. But the one thing that I think that we all do that I'm so very happy about and that soft supports is we share information on doctors who, as Aaron said, 
love our babies, who are ho holistically treating our children, who who respect our wishes, who understand the 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 sense of urgency too that we have in respect to heart repair, and not telling us to uh, wait and see. Wait and see is is not an option in my opinion when you're dealing with the fact that 90% of our babies have congenital heart defects that require some type of intervention. And most of us are not gonna be in that 10% where we can go without the repair. And so <clears throat> us sharing information and being at hospitals and immediately getting information to the moms of where they can go um, is, is very pertinent in getting the heart repair and getting parents in position for those who can um, to advocate as, um, as much as they need to. And I think the earlier you find out in your pregnancy, the better. Sometimes it's not always financial. You can stay at a Ronald McDonald house. I know my family did. There are ways to, to get this, these things for our children. And I think our networking um, is, is part of the shift that we're seeing as well. Our ability, I think just, like I said, two years ago, we were all crowding Dr. Hamill to get that repair. And when other places saw that we were leaving and that we were taking our children, and I think that kind of pushed them to do more in as far as the heart repairs, but keep sharing your stories and keep, keep sharing the names of these doctors. I mean, I don't know how inappropriate or appropriate it is to say, hey, Dr. So-and-so did not help, or this doctor did help. Um, and of course, as trisomy parents, we have totally different stories. And, and we have totally different experiences with these doctors than um, quote unquote typical children. You know, I, I tell people all the time, there's a doctor at TCH named Dr. Nancy Ayers and typical children and their parents, there's these lovely stories. But for our trisomy parents, not only myself, but others, we have had horrible stories. And so when we are uh, facing the diagnosis and we're getting our feet in there, I think it's really important for us to get to the helpers find the helpers and find the people that will get our children what they need. And I think that that's another part of this whole heart discussion that needs to happen. You know, don't worry about the fetal echo sound so much because you're going to find out more when the baby is born. And sometimes you're going to find out that you worry too much, but mm -hmm. in the process, we need to get that out. We need to share the information about these doctors. Yes. Thanks, Chelsea. Anyone else have any other thoughts that came up as you were listening to each other's stories? Yes, um, I wanted to hop on really quick. Yay, Sorry, Lil decided to take herself off of the pulse lock. She's got wild bedhead right now. Um, I think Jessica was the one who made me think of this, but um, so whenever Lillian was, when I was pregnant with her, actually, one thing that we consistently used because we were concerned that we were at a hospital that wasn't going to be trisomy friendly. And we all know that a lot of us end up in that place. And so it makes it, it made it really hard for us personally to trust someone to take care of her, even though they were like promising us the world. Um, but whenever we would do any, guys, this hair, any type of meetings with our doctors, like I just kept echoing, if you would do this procedure or surgery or intervention for a child with normal, cro normal chromosomes with this condition, we expect it to be done for her. Like we know that, um, and she brought up something else, like you're terrible for, you know, putting your child through heart surgery and all of this stuff. And we had like several instances where we sent her to the OR knowing that she may not come out. But one thing that we would kind of argue back with them, especially about her heart. Um, we knew that she had a heart that would go into severe heart failure and severe, like unrepairable pulmonary hypertension if we didn't do anything. And so whenever they would challenge us, like, you do know that she may not come out of the OR, like doing this heart surgery could kill her, blah, 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 blah. Um, we would just tell them, we know that doing this could, you know, cause issues and, she may not come out of the OR, but we also know that if we don't send her in, she's not going to survive much amount of time anyway. So we're comfortable with that. And so that was just one big thing for us that I feel like really pushed them to go ahead and 
get her surgeries done instead of just dancing around the bush was like, we're serious about this. We know what we're getting ourselves into. We've connected with other families who have been there and done this. And um, we expect fair and equal treatment for her regardless of how many chromosomes she has. Yeah. Well said, well said. Yes, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to really quickly say absolutely true to that. I know for me, the day that it became very clear, um, I always, like I said, when I said I faked it before I made it, um, I was talking a big talk, but I still didn't know. But the day I was completely at peace, um, being a CHD mom and being a mom that got to a point where her daughter did have to have surgery to live, I got to the point where um, I was at peace. Um, and I hate to bring this up, but like Olivia said, if my daughter passed in the OR, we were going to try. And I think once I started, I wasn't faking that part. That was true. Um, but it was going to be with the right people. Um, so the best I could get. So, um, once I had that piece, I was off and running. Like once my brain got out of my own way for things like I'm a mother of six, how can I go to Omaha, Nebraska? Um, my husband just lost his job. How can I ask them to save my daughter? I mean, we're human beings. We feel vulnerable. We feel weak, but I started to grow a lot. And what I wanted to share very quickly is I grew really fast when you're on a heart unit and you're in a NICU, you see all these other children getting care and something changes in you and you think, why not my kid? And so from there, I thought, for all these. And so we, we, we took that step and then there was always something there to help. Ronald McDonald House, Rainbow House, some kind of agency, something. And so you just move forward knowing you're not asking for the impossible. People do this every day. Mm -hmm. Children's medicine exists to help people and nobody's perfect. So you just kind of step in and then you'll just see, um, you'll just see that um, really hard days come, but very amazing, beautiful things come too. So just hold hope. Absolutely. I, um, to what Mary and Olivia also said, I had to look them in the eye and say, I have seen what heart failure looks like. And I know that that's what my option is going home. And so I would rather lose her in the OR trying to fight for years of memories than to have three bad months with her at home. And that gave them the courage, I think, to finally act because they were like, you know, it could kill her. I'm like, so could any medication I ask you to give her. You don't know. I don't know. She's unique. Um, but the one thing I was going to add that I really learned the hard way, get on the patient portal as soon as possible. And every single test that is ran on your child, every, um, echo, every x-ray, every CT, read it for yourself, because especially in emergent ICU scenarios, they're playing firefighters and they're looking for specific things. But then when you have the global view of your child, all of that information can come together to really help your child down the road. Um, there was a situation where we discovered through her lung CT, when they found out that she also had pneumonia on top of her pulmonary hypertension crisis, that her pulmonary artery was collapsing her bronchial. And so they were able to fix that when they went in and did her heart surgery but they wouldn't have seen it had I not pointed it out as being on her CT, so. You know, when you said that, um, I don't know if anybody from Houston will be listening to this, but I know Aaron also knows this. To piggyback off what you just said, when you are in the NICU four at TCH, you have no access to, um, I know I did not, even through my, my chart, I did not have access to any actual test results. Uh -huh. And I relied on the NICU team to tell me the test results. And a lot of the answers that you get, especially when it comes to heart functionality is, oh, it's, it's just jazz. And it's just jazz, it's not the name or not a diagnosis, it's not an explanation to tell you, oh, it's just what they do. Um, and leading up to that heart repair, just to, this is from my final statement, you will see so many barriers put in front of you when you finally do get uh, the red light, I mean, the green light for the repair. You will get anesthesiology that comes by and talks to you about death. Um, you will get the OR nurse come and remind you, oh, yeah, you're well, there's no choice here. 
mm-hmm. he's either going to die today on your mm-hmm. table or he's going to die for sure next week so one is maybe and one of one answer is for sure and so you have a lot of people that make you doubt your choice you have got to be <laughs> stoic and you have got to stand your ground that this is what it is there is no turning back there is no um change in my mind this is humanity getting the help for my child is humanity it, it absolutely is and we have to be very uh, steadfast in our insistence on that because if you aren't that's your child's life you can't and even if it's like what mary was saying you may not necessarily be 100 percent sure of what you're saying but you have to be sure in your heart that you're making the right decision for your child and you cannot allow the doubts the long stares the 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 the, the faces you can't you just you have to be really stone-faced about that in in very steadfast and make sure that your child has the um does not have a dnr on them make sure that Every time you turn around, you're, you're checking while you're in the NICU to make sure that they're full code. Always check. If you move from unit to unit, full code, always look for that as well. Sarita so sent a question for everyone. For those with care plans, did you feel they were effective hearing that some physicians discounted written requests? Did you continue to search for physicians who would honor those plans? And then did you ever yes. feel like they were losing efficiency? Good yes. question. Yes. Yes. Yeah, jump in. So, yeah. Okay. Care plans. So I had care plans pregnant and I had care plans after she was born. Um, like I think I, I told in my story, I do not regret having this extensive care plan. I basically, just to be very quick, if you were to think of a, a NICU baby, a preterm baby that would get access to the NICU, um, really my care plan was that my child was going to be like a preterm baby. She was four pounds. She was born full term, but we know they have interuterine growth delay. So I started there that my child needed everything that a preterm baby would have access to kind of what, like Olivia said, what a typical. So that helped me focus on my care plan. And when it was challenged and eyebrows were raised and do you know how cruel this is type of thing? Um, I could just stand fast in that, that look, this is a pre, this is like a preemie. We live in, you know, We live in a very developed society. We help preemies every day. We're going to treat her that way. That care plan got me so far. And yes, it did. It did get ignored. Sometimes it did get denied sometimes, but it was my shield. So I got very sick when Rose was really little and I had to leave my husband in charge of her care. And I told him he was lost. Like he was kind of in denial. He, I would tell him, you know, they're, they're, da, 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 they're not to let the CPAP leave the room. And he was just lost. So I had care plans made and I told him, this is her shield. This is her. You don't, you just hold it up. <laughs> and, and I will tell you it worked. Um, it was dismissed at some uh, care meetings and it was, uh, and, and we got some chuckles. Some of it wasn't perfect, but we got some chuckles about it, but who cares? Um, you don't have an ego. You're just kind of on, um, fight or flight and you're fighting. And if, and when the case manager, that's what I want to say real quick, the case manager that did get us to Omaha, like when the final thing that got us there was really this case manager going the extra mile and making it happen. Cause it was denied by her insurance. And then it was denied by her state insurance. And this case manager made it happen. Um, I asked her a year later, we got a chance to talk. And she said, you came in day one, you came in day one. And every single day you handed, you asked the charge nurse to give your care plan to the unit director. Those two words are huge. They somehow started thinking I was a genius because I used the word charge nurse and unit director. So use, go to the top, go to the top. Don't like, tell your nurse. I mean, so we handed those daily. And so it was, even if it didn't get to the unit director, which a lot didn't, it got to the case manager. So she, I didn't even know her, but she was seeing this happen and it was consistent and it was daily and it was assertive. So she said, I knew this family, what knew what they were getting into and I wanted to help you. So a care plan absolutely showed we knew what we were getting into. And we fumbled through it until we got really good at it. I got to where I could just scribble on a napkin and hand it to my husband and he could, you know, run down the hall from the hospitals were connected. Um, and he had to run tunnels to get to the children's hospital from me, but 
he would do it and he'd just hand the napkin <laughs> and then CPAP would be brought in. I mean, it was phenomenal. So yes, get very comfortable with that. Maybe bring a laptop. Um, I could, it wasn't COVID, I could pop over to Ronald McDonald House and I could use their printer. And it is like the Underground Railroad. You are just, I mean, when you're in it, I'm not in it now, so, but it is like secret. It is crazy. <laughs> so something that brings um, structure to that is, is an organized care plan. And then you can just daily update it and have something to go off of. And if you ever feel really lost, you know, shoot out to our community, someone will help you. And you can just go back stronger because you have a little more information. And, and, you know, one physician does not determine my child's life. So that's kind of when I read on there that, you know, did it, do care plans even help if physicians don't want them or don't listen to them, get a new physician. Yeah, Sarita, I was just going to add, um, I don't know if you're a part of any of the, uh, which groups you're a part of, but if you look under the files um, on the Facebook pages, oftentimes that's where these <clears throat> care plans, like I put one on there um, that I had kind of studied somebody else's. And so I'd kind of deleted Cora's personal info. But if you look on there, I tried to put something together already um, in part because Nobody really wants to have to be processing through mm -hmm. these. It yes. really does help. Um, if nothing else, it helps you kind of process through what exactly you guys want, but also um, you don't have to repeat yourself over and over again, which is pretty exhausting and emotionally taxing. And so I, um, I put together ours. I made it one page. So it was really succinct and I laminated it and I gave it to our doctor and I said, put it in her chart. So that way it was like the first thing anybody sees when they pull up Cora's chart. I also always have a copy with me um, that I hang up on her bed. So it's right there. And it says first thing, you know, Cora's name, um, picture with all of her siblings and full code, not slow code. It's big, bold. And then underneath it, I list like all of her diagnoses and her medicines and things she likes, her typical stats, all that kind of thing. But I, I've placed that in the files section of the, um, you know, it, the living trisomy life, I think is the one that I have that on. Um, and I know others have theirs as well. There have been some that, that were upset that I did that. I think they were like, just appalled that some of us would even have to think to do that because of course they would care. But unfortunately, many of us have realized that there are people who um, don't um, see our kids as a waste of resources and effort and time. And once you run up against that, I learned pretty quickly, I'm just going to show them in writing what our desires are and, and they'll know from the get go. And so I don't even have to have that discussion if they don't feel the same way we do, you know. Thank you, Erin. I am going to have to close this down um, be just because I have another meeting to run to. But in closing, for those who are watching this, who are kind of preparing themselves, feeling themselves because baby has, you know, they, they think they've seen something on a fetal echo or, or whatnot, and they're, they're bracing themselves. I know because I'm listening to these mamas and I'm in awe of what they have done, what they've had to do, what they've gone through. And so I can imagine being pregnant and thinking, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> and so what, what I want to leave you with is you can do this these women had on the job training <laughs> and they are amazing in part because they have amazing kids that they've been advocating for and they have stepped up and they have had to say the things and do the things in order to advocate for their child's life. And so if you are, if this is in your future or in your baby's future, please know you will be equipped. You can do this job. And there's a community here willing to, and ready and excited and eager to support you through a journey that you don't know if you can get through it. So I, if we had even more time, I know that all these ladies could share the testimony of how this journey has changed them, how they have become more confident and more, um, 
just more passionate about what needs to be done. And they don't care. You know, they, they don't care if they hurt, <laughs> hurt someone's feelings. They're going to get the care they need for their child. And we all admire you so much for that. So thank you, ladies, so much for sharing your story. Thank you, Sarita, for your great questions. Um, if there's anything else that you think of, you go in um, after the, the video is on Trisomy Talk on the page, and you can certainly put it in the chat there. And of course, um, we'll be sharing this afterwards as well. And you're welcome to share it. So thanks again so much for your time, everyone, and have a fabulous Thank you. Night. Thank you. Take care.